Hello and welcome back to part four of our look at the skeletal system. Uh, we are getting ready to spend the next 15-20 minutes looking at and talking about the process by which we uh, lengthen bone, rebuild bone, and initially produce bone during fetal development. Uh, the overarching process that we are really talking about, in other words, when we talk about uh, bone formation, uh, that overall arching process is what we call osteogenesis. Um, and that is the production or the process of producing bone. Now understand that there's a couple different processes that we need to look at, and we're going to touch on these um, individually uh, and give you a better understanding of what exactly goes into the formation of our skeletal system. And so with that said, uh, let's go back to the beginning. And I don't mean the beginning of time, but I mean the beginning of life. We, we have to go back into fetal development. And the earliest skeleton or skeleton-like structure that we have during fetal development uh, is made out of hyaline cartilage. Now, remember that I alluded to in the last video that the epiphyseal plate or what you re commonly refer to as the growth plate uh, is made out of hyaline cartilage. And that, that, that the presence of the hyaline cartilage allows for bone lengthening. So it should not surprise you that during fetal development, the entire fetal skeleton is made out of hyaline cartilage. Um, during the second trimester, uh, in and around week six, starting right around week six, that hyaline cartilage begins to undergo a process uh, whereas the hyaline cartilage is replaced with ossified bone. And that process is what we refer to as endochondrial ossification. Now let's look at that word, endochondrial ossification. All right, now that is a term that we can break that down into its root, chondrial, which we know refers to cartilage, endo, which means within, right? and so it is within the cartilage that we initiate ossification. In other words, the transformation into bone. And during fetal development, this endochondrial ossification, this process of creating bone from within the cartilage, starts within the diaphysis. It starts within the shaft of the long bone and goes outward into the epiphysis. That is something to keep in mind because when we get into the adults, this process is actually reversed. It's actually bone lengthening happens and starts and it is initiated at the epiphysis. And that bone lengthening process moves down towards the diaphysis. But within the fetal fetus, within the fetal development, this process is happening within the diaphysis and then extends outwards into the epiphysis. Uh, within flat bones, within the flat bones, this process is referred to as intramembraneous ossification. Intra meaning within, membraneous within the membrane. We see ossification. In other words, we create the, um, the spongy bone first, and then secondarily, we create the external and the internal plates, which we know is made out of compact bone. That is a process that happens later on during development. Those external and internal plates do not form until 
uh, somewhere during the third trimester. Um, and it's one of the leading causes of soft spots, uh, which we now know we can define as being those fontanelles, that anterior fontanelle, the posterior fontanelle, and the anterolateral and postolateral fontanelles, the soft spots. They form because you have exposed um, trabecular bone that has not completely formed those external platea. And that allows for flexibility within the skull, which is needed during the birthing process. And so this here is a pretty little picture um, of what y'all looked like in your uh, fetal stage. This is here's uh, second trimester. Um, I would say late second trimester. All right. But here's what you're seeing. Wherever you see red, right, this is an area of red bone marrow. And if you look, oh, let's see here. Let's do green. If you look within the cranial bones, you can actually see all that spongy bone. Right? Look at the mandible. Look at the maxilla. Look at the vertebrae. Look at the clavicle. Look at the scapula. Look at the ribs. Look at the humerus. Look at the radius, look at the ulna, look at the femur, look at the coxal bone. Everywhere you see bone, you see the presence of red bone marrow. This makes sense. This makes sense because the fetus is rapidly growing and developing. And you need an increased rate of blood flow and blood production, hematopoiesis, to keep up with the rate of growth and development. You need to be able to fill the vessels as the fetus is growing and developing. So you need a whole lot of that blood production. You need a whole lot of hematopoiesis that is going on. And by the way, this continues once you are born, right? as an infant, as a toddler, think about how fast you're growing as an infant right? into the toddlers, into the child development stage. You have rapid growth. Right? Think about as a teenager. You ever hear growing pains? Right? It's because the person is growing. They're, they're, they're getting taller at such a fast rate, the tendons and the ligaments aren't keeping up. Well, their blood supply needs to be able to keep up. And so this presence of this red bone marrow that we're seeing in this fetal scan um, carries through infancy, toddler, child, adolescence. Um, of course, the amount of red bone marrow starts to diminish, it starts to get replaced with yellow bone marrow the older we get and the closer to our 20s that we get. But this is a great graphical representation um, of what is happening. And as far as the process that is involved, we see that we have five steps that are here. All right. In step one, hold on one second, I'm going to change my laser pointer. In step one right here, here is that fetal skeleton that is made out of hyaline cartilage. And so you can see this, this is all hyaline cartilage. There is no bone. But we have in the center of our fetal bone what we define as being the primary ossification center. And it's within this ossification center where osteoclasts begin to break down the hyaline cartilage. Right. And so you can see that area of deteriorating cartilage matrix here, right here in the center. Right. And so that is being driven by osteoclasts that are breaking that down. Now, this will eventually become the medullary cavity or the medullary canal where we will find our red bone marrow going through the diaphysis and later on in life, the yellow bone marrow. Uh, 
during fetal development, though, we're not as concerned right yet with bone marrow as we are blood supply. And that's what you're seeing there in step three. Uh, the periosteal bud uh, is what we define as being that initial blood supply going into the bone. This is a process that's going to take a lot of energy. And so we need to have blood supply that's coming, that's delivering uh, glucose, that's delivering oxygen, that's delivering calcium, that's delivering all of the nutrients and the mineralization that we need in order to start to ossify this cartilage. As uh, we continue here into birth, right, you can see that the medullary canal is formed, that the diaphysis has ossified itself over, and within the epiphysius, we begin to see the same process, except we're not developing um, compact bone. We're developing trabecular bone. We're developing spongy bone. All right. And you can see that as we enter into adolescence, that the diaphysis and the epiphysius is divided by the epiphyseal plate, what we define as being the growth plate that we've already distinguished as being made of hyaline cartilage. Why hyaline cartilage? Because that was what was there during fetal development. What we see here is the process of creating that bone during um, growth and development, after fetal development, after the birthing process. So we can see that bone lengthening is happening um, starting at the epiphyseal plate, down towards the diaphysis, and we have four distinct regions. We have the zone of reserve cartilage, the zone of proliferating cartilage or hyperplastic cartilage, the zone of hypertrophic cartilage, and the zone of calcified matrix. And the next few slides go through this process. Um, and so on this slide, the zone of reserve cartilage, uh, this would be the area that is closest to, hold on one second, the, epiphysis, uh, the epiphyseal plate. And so uh, if I come in here and draw this, uh, here is my line right there. Right. And so this right here would be our zone. of reserve cartilage. All right. And so this is really what anchors the epiphysius to the epiphyseal plate. This is where, uh, this is really an area of stem cells. This is where all of our uh, 2B newly formed bone during lengthening, bone lengthening, is going to come from. Right. Um, so think of this area as being an area of stem cells for, for chondrocytes. And that should make sense because this is an area that is made up of hyaline cartilage. So we expect there to be a presence of chondrocytes. Look, I'm getting fancy and doing cursive writing now. There we go. Speeds that process up a little bit. All right. So from the zone of reserve cartilage, we then go into the zone of hyperplastic cartilage. All right. um, and so again, if we look at our root words that are present, I get tired of using the same colors. All right. Hyper here means increased, right? Increased. Plasia right? Uh, is a, uh, a word that means to divide. Uh, 
All right, and so here we have an area of increased cell division. In other words, those chondrocytes are dividing at an increased rate. And so let's come back in here. And so we started with our zone of reserve cartilage right here. Right. And then we came in and we saw an area of increased cell growth and division. So we're adding at an increased rate new cells, not just any new cells, but specifically we are adding a high number of chondrocytes. And that is what's happening during the zone of reserve, I'm sorry, zone of hyperplastic cartilage. And then once those cells are done rapidly dividing, we enter into the zone of hypertrophic cartilage. And the zone of hypertrophic cartilage involves hyper means increase, trophy means to feed. And so when you feed a lot, you get bigger. And so these, this is an area where those chondrocytes increase in cell size not number. So the rate of division slows down, almost stops, and those cells then transition into getting larger. And so if we come back here, all right, so we got our zone of reserve cartilage right here, followed by the zone of hyperplastic cartilage right here and then those cells begin to enlarge large large cells large cells, large cells, all right. Now, what follows is the zone of calcified matrix. This is where the chondrocytes die off and they die off by a process that we've, I, I believe, talked about before, apoptosis. Right. Um, apoptosis means programmed cell death or induced cell death. And so the chondrocytes die off. And when they die, calcium salts rush in to the chondrocyte that is now dead and begins to harden that cell. Once that cell is hardened um, due to the calcium salts, the hydroxyapatite that gets absorbed rapidly into those cells, osteoclasts come in and they begin to break down that matrix. Um, and in doing so, that again is going to trigger the osteoblast to then come in and actually lay down new bone. Now keep in mind, right, those osteoclasts are going to come in, uh, they're going to release acid phosphatase, they're going to create that pit of reabsorption, it's going to lower the pH, it's going to cause the phosphate to be released from the hy hydroxyapatite, and it's going to stimulate the osteoblasts. And when it stimulates the osteoblast, it releases osteocalcin, which is going to trigger growth and development of muscle to be able to keep up with the rate of lengthening. It's going to go ahead and trigger um, um, uh, uh, glucogenesis, which is that new formation of glucose. It's going to cause the breakdown and the release of glucose for cell respiration for ATP production. It's going to cause neural stimulation. It's going to cause the release of testosterone to aid in vitamin D production. All of these things begin cascading again under the direction of osteocalcin, which was released from the osteoblast triggered by the drop in pH because of the osteoclasts and its release of acid phosphatase.
And what does that all look like? Well, this kind of shows what that all looks like. And um, we only have a few more little slides left here at our look at bone growth and development. Again, you can kind of see where those various areas are um, just to kind of point out to you. All right, and so right in here would be your zone of reserve cartilage. This here would be the zone of hyperplastic growth. This would be the zone of hypertrophic cartilage. And this would be the zone of calcified matrix. And so those areas that we just looked at are seen right here on this slide. All right, so how does all of this equal growth and development? Well, let's take a look. So uh, in order to understand this, especially in light of puberty, uh, we have to look at hormones because hormones is really what's driving all of this. As you are an infant, as you are a toddler and a child and an adolescent, it is human growth hormone that is really driving and regulating um, bone lengthening. All right? And so human growth hormone uh, is a hormone that is released from within the pituitary gland under the direction of the hypothalamus, um, just like what we saw with um, negative feedback mechanisms regulating osteoblast activity. But, and, and as well as um, thyroid hormone, but, but here's what happens. At the onset of puberty, the rate of thyroid activity, aka release of calcitonin, spikes. And as that spikes, uh, testosterone levels also spike. And this happens in both male and females. Within females, it's the adrenal gland that is producing and releasing testosterone. In males, it is both the adrenal gland and the testis that is producing and secreting testosterone. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why males tend to be taller than females. This isn't always the case, but in generality, this is the case. And that's because males are producing more testosterone. And testosterone is driving that epiphyseal plate to become overactive, which drives those that lengthening of the bone, and explains growth spurts, explains growing pains, which again is the bone outpacing the lengthening process. Uh, it's outpacing the skeletal muscle and the ability for the tendons and the ligaments to stretch to keep up with that growth. And so the sex hormones, the, the testosterone and its derivatives, um, DHT, DHEA, dihydrotestosterone and dihydroepialdosterone drive the sex hormones. It's driving that rapid growth combined with calcitonin. It's, again, increased stimulation from the thyroid gland itself. And it does this um, up until the epiphyseal plate basically burns out. It basically burns out. Um, and when it burns out, that hyaline cartilage ossifies over and lengthening of that bone within the long bones. Stop. It ceases. Well, that was a lot to take in. The last slide that we have is what happens when you break a bone? Um, specifically a long bone, since that's what we've been focused on. Uh, and so this four-step process here is basically uh, kind of giving you that visual representation of what is happening. And so uh, in step one, right here, we see that there is a new break in the bone. Fall off a bike, and you break your humerus. You trip over a rock and break your femur, whatever it might be. The first thing that's going to happen is um, a hematoma is going to form, specifically what we define as being a fracture uh, hematoma. Uh, 
a fracture hematoma fracture hematoma a fracture hematoma uh, is basically a pooling pooling of blood uh, it's, it's a blood clot that forms around the area of the break this initiates an inflammatory response it initiates swelling within the area uh, and the reason for that is to immobilize the broken area All right, so that way you don't cause further damage now remember you've broken blood vessels which is why you're bleeding out and that blood is pooling uh, and it's creating that hematoma underneath of the skin right. the other thing that this does is now that you've got all of these broken blood vessels that are bleeding into this broken area this wound uh, it brings within it mesenchymal cells and these mesenchymal cells that should sound familiar to you Right. We know that mesenchymal cells are stem cells that have the ability to differentiate and become connective tissue. Connective tissue, bone, cartilage, all of this is starting to tie in together with what we talked about within tissues. And so uh, within this hematoma, you get a high degree of mesenchymal cells. You also get immune cells uh, you get what we call neutrophils and um, um, the other one is is uh, completely escaping my mind uh, basophils that's just came back to me you get neutrophils and basophils that flood into this area as well as endothelial cells now the endothelial cells are helping to reform the blood vessels the immune cells the neutrophils and the um, basophils um, they are coming in to uh, basically help to start to break down the blood clots right, to reduce the inflammation and what is happening is as you're breaking down that blood clot you are starting to replace that area with fibrocartilage and that's what creates that callus that happens within that break and then that fibrocartilage starts to be broken down by osteoclasts and in its place you get spongy bone that develops and forms and then that spongy bone gets broken down and it gets replaced finally with compact bone right. and that fracture is now healed um, and so that is our look at the last part of our look of our uh, exploration of the skeletal system, which is bone lengthening and bone remodeling. Um, take your time, kind of review this as you need, and uh, let me know if you have any questions.